It's my great pleasure to welcome again uh, Sam to the podium. Sam spoke yesterday as a member of the, of the panel, and I'm just going to, I'm doing my short version of myself. Um, Sam uh, was with us on the panel, and Anne gave a very nice introduction. She is a Harvard graduate and works uh, with the Center for uh, Applied Special Technology, known as CAST. And she's doing some really interesting work at the, involving um, post-secondary education. And she'll be telling us about that. But what's really important for all of you to know is that she is Canadian <laughs> and hails from Montreal. And, and somehow we lost her to the United States. But we're really happy that she's able to be back here with us and share in this exciting event. So over to you, Sam. Well, thank you. Jody underestimated my height. <laughs> About an inch taller than this. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much for, um, for having me here today. As Jody said, I'm Canadian, proudly Canadian. Um, and the nice thing for me here is that um, at least some of you are from two of the institutions of higher education where I did much of my education, Dawson College and McGill University. Um, and higher education was really where I took off as a learner. Uh, and the reason I really did take off as a learner in higher ed was because I had teachers and I had peers that really recognized the ways in which I needed to learn and found ways to help open doors to learning that way. So for example, when I was in um, Russian class, do not ask me any questions in Russian, I, it's gone now. Um, but when I was in Russian class and the language labs called for a great deal of rote memorization and it was not something that I could do successfully, the chair of the Russian department arranged for me and some other students or let us arrange to meet weekly with new Russian immigrants and have that fulfill our conversational um, requirement for our course and we got part of our course grade for that. Um, and it really, you know, there were a number of examples like that at both Dawson and McGill where people really figured out how do we sort of take this learner, leverage her strengths, and create environments where her weaknesses don't trump her strengths. And I think that's sort of the underlying message of UDL. Um, the reality is, is for me, um, the fact that I fell in love with learning in higher ed was not a foregone conclusion. Um, I started my schooling experience, my first schooling experience um, started uh, with a nun that was very adamant that I not be left-handed. Um, and, you know, that, that I'm going to date myself, um, the fact that that practice was still going on. But it was so uh, taxing, actually, to be pulled out of school halfway through the year. So I knew at a very early age um, how incredibly contextual disability is. Um, and I think that, you know, at a very early age, the seeds for the importance of universal design for learning were planted. Um, and so, you know, what I hope today and what I hope you sort of carry on with and the great work I'm seeing is the idea of universal design for learning for everyone, not just the students in higher ed like me that are lucky that they landed on professors and fellow students that said, this is someone who loves learning. How do we open doors for them? Everybody loves learning. And we need to be able to open doors for the vast, you know, the array of students that we have. Um, so that will be our focus um, today. And some of you, you know, there's a whole range of knowledge of UDL from sort of basic to um, people who've been doing this work and really doing some wonderful research projects we heard about yesterday. Um, what I hope is, is regardless of what level you're at, you'll be able to sort of make connections in your own context. Um, so this first session is more, um, a little bit more sort of presentational style. The next session will be somewhat presentational as well, but we'll be looking at a website that we've developed at CAS, which is our first sort of first pass at trying to articulate UDL in higher ed. And I'll be looking for some feedback both today and beyond today on what should be in there? Um, what should we be talking about? How do we include your perspectives there? Um, so the first thing I want to do is talk about three 
very big shifts that are impacting all of us in higher ed um, and in the workforce, and then talk about how universal design for learning and the three UDL principles can help us navigate those shifts and really leverage them as, um, as opportunities for all of our students. Um, so the, the three sort of areas I want to talk about are, you know, as this is going to come as no surprise to anyone, but the area of education technology, the growing use of technology really in our classrooms, not even as sort of a, a nice to have or a possible thing, but, you know, really what we do use uh, in our classrooms. And as well, the fact that our students are using these things outside of the classroom and pulling them in whether we want them to or not, or whether we, you know, students are now tweeting from the classroom. These are, it's, these are game changing, the use of education technology in classroom. How do we sort of make sure we use that in a way that really enhances learning and teaching? The second um, sort of major shift is the, is the shift uh, in workforce, in the informal learning sector, and increasingly in formal education from a focus on kind of individual intelligence to distributed intelligence, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and the third is really, um, and we, you know, and the colleagues from McGill yesterday, I felt a lot of um, resonance with this third idea, this notion of hospitality, um, which I'll talk about a little bit as well, but it's sort of this notion that we really do need a different relationship um, between the institutions and the individual students that come onto our campuses especially those students that, um, that often come into the campus and feel uh, like outliers from what we sort of imagine as, as what we like to say at CAS, sort of the mythical average student. Um, so I want to talk about those sort of three concepts and then show how each of the universal design for learning principles and some of our applied work helps us navigate those, those shifts. So as we know, sort of new technologies um, create new possibilities, um, and they're there, you know, especially they increasingly help us um, generate a new media set um, for education. So the idea of uh, print being the dominant medium in education is changing very, very rapidly. We now have a richer media set, a richer toolbox to work with, um, with all of our students, which naturally is going to help certain students, for example, students who have print-based disabilities are much better served by a richer media set. Um, and we also need to think about what barriers do these new media erect. But Fisher suggests that um, one of the problems is that um, education often comes on the boot heels of technology. So rather than the other way around, the technology's there, and then we figure out how to use it in education, whereas we need to be really operating the other way around. And he sort of cites two, two kind of extremes that are problematic in the use of technology in education. Um, the first is really this idea of sort of a gift wrapping approach. Um, so, you know, if you think of gift wrapping, it's not the present, it doesn't really contribute anything of, um, of real substance to uh, the teaching and learning process. So, one example of this for that I, would, um, that I would use is the incredible reliance in especially online learning um, formative assessments on the use of sort of embedded multiple choice quizzes. Um, that's sort of like old wine in new bottles. Now it doesn't mean that there's not times where we shouldn't use that, but the capacities of new technologies to provide much richer assessments is something that we need to leverage if we're gonna really accurately understand what students know, what they learn, and then use that to sort of inform instruction. So that's sort of a gift wrapping approach to technology. We've had multiple choice around since the 1950s. Why all of a sudden we have these new very powerful opportunities in classroom, would we say, you know, we're gonna port that over and not do much else? It really is sort of like old wine in, in new bottles. Um, at the other end of the spectrum is this idea of sort of techno-determinism, and I think this is where a lot of sort of fear of the use of technology comes, and that's where people sort of take an incredibly powerful technology integrated into education without, without sort of clear strategies for how it's going to impact learning and teaching, and especially how you're going to be able to assess 
progress um, or the work that's done in those, those mediums. So the world of sort of simulations is incredibly powerful and rich and great ways we can use it, but we need to think about how we measure progress in simulations, how we train people to participate in those things properly, how we support faculty to use them. We don't want this sort of techno-determinism end of things um, where technology drives learning rather than the reverse. Um, so tied to this notion, and I think really in part because of the fact that we now live in, a net, in, a, in really a networked world um, and the demands of, of our of our world today, um, there's really a shift from individual um, individual intelligence to distributed intelligence. And Fisher, who's um, the director of the, the Center for Lifelong Learning and Design at the University of Colorado Boulder, all of his stuff is available for free on his website. So if you're interested in his work, I would go read. He really writes very powerfully about distributed intelligence. But he says, um, wicked problems require meaningful relationships amongst people with access to different knowledge systems to frame, examine, and resolve. Um, so if you think of an example of this, um, let's think about trying to reduce fuel consumption to try to impact global warming. If we thought of that only from the lawyer's lens, we wouldn't get very far, right? Not everybody's going to think about that problem from a regulatory framework or from you know, the, the legal implications of it. But if we have uh, lawyers, environmentalists, politicians, citizens, um, you know, kids, different people sort of together figuring out how do we reduce fuel consumption and having the tools and technologies at hand to work on that problem together, we actually get pretty far. Um, and we also get consensus, which is really important. And so when we think about distributed intelligence, it's not just what knowledge do people have or what skills do they have, but what are their values and beliefs around the particular problem. And I think that this is really game changing for higher education. And I think um, it really, it's a paradigm that's increasingly the paradigm in the workforce. It's certainly the paradigm in informal learning. It's how our kids learn. It's how our students and universities learn. Um, and I think it needs to be really central in higher ed in a way that um, it's still not. Um, so that's sort of, you know, a way of capitalizing also on the value of variability um, in our workforce and our education system. And a really nice um, way of describing this um, is, uh, is uh, I'm looking in the English version, I'm, unfortunately these two are off by one, but um, we're looking here at a fish scale, and nobody likes to see a picture of a dead fish on a screen. Um, <laughs> who can blame you? But um, what, uh, what this is is Donald Campbell, who was a um, psychologist operating in the 1960s, um, basically said that the, the discipline of social science, it's not going to develop by training what he sort of said were a bunch of Leonardos, so people who are cross-trained, so someone who's um, got the skills in biology and the skills in statistics, someone who's, uh, he said, what's the way in which we're going to be able to um, build disciplinary competence is by creating um, collective comprehensiveness through overlapping patterns of unique narrowness. And what he said is that we need to let people be individuals. We need to let them be skilled in the areas in which they're going to be skilled um, and build knowledge around things they care about and they're passionate about. And we also need to be able to teach them how to meaningfully overlap with the skills of others. Um, so much like the scales on a fish, that overlap in these, in these tiny ways to, to cover the whole fish and to make sure the whole fish is protected, we need to be able to do that um, in, our, in our education system and in our workforce so that we have full coverage of what we want to know. But the goal in distributed intelligence is not to have everybody understand the exact same things and demonstra demonstrate that they understand these things in the same way. It's to get collective comprehensiveness through um, through letting people be uniquely narrow and also able to relate to others. So I think it's a really powerful concept for how we think about 
our teaching and learning in higher education? How do we let people be individuals and also know how to um, be successful at learning and building the knowledge base with other individuals that has slightly different um, skills, interests, abilities? So just to sort of summarize those concepts, um, the idea is that what we want to do is sort of focus on, with the use of technology, how do we use it to augment intelligence as opposed to kind of artificial intelligence where computers are more powerful than people? How do we support groups for social creativity, not just individual creativity? So how do we kind of create the context in higher education where we have people who are creative because they're in a social environment where everybody's sort of contributing to resolving a problem, like the fuel consumption problem? Um, and part of the ways in which we need to do this is by contextualizing generic systems through aiding meta design. So if you think of something like Google using Google Earth or Google SketchUp, those are sort of systems or crowdsourcing. Those are systems where everybody has a hand in the design. There's not, it's a slightly flatter system for design or even things like making students work very visible to other students. It's a way of designing the curriculum in ways that are not, um, you know, one, one to many. So teacher to individual students. How do we customize um, environments so that people, or how do we let people customize environments so they're using them to solve their own problems? Um, and then how do we let people sort of, you know, design, have end user um, development? So in that context, if you think of something like Maybe you don't provide your entire curriculum, but you actually let your students, some people have done this, create sort of wiki, wiki books for the course, whereas they sort of get gradually more knowledgeable about what's going on, they actually contribute to the content or curriculum in the course. Um, so those are sort of just some overarching thoughts about how our, our views and our need for supporting teaching and learning are, are actually changing. Um, and then this is, uh, this is the only statistic I'll use today, so. Um, but it, this is from the National uh, Transition Study of um, Young Adults with Disabilities. Um, and I often use this statistic, which shows that in, um, these are the same kids, the same young adults, 87% of them in secondary, in, in the K-12 system, receive support based on having a disability. Those same students, only 19% of them receive support for having a disability in post-secondary. They didn't go away, they're in post-secondary, but the degree to which they're receiving support is drastically different. Um, and so I often cite that statistic as a way of sort of pragmatically saying we need a different approach to accommodations. And our colleagues from McGill were talking about that um, yesterday, pragmatically, you cannot serve people you cannot identify. Um, you know, that alone calls for a different approach, but I think what um, this speaks to much more powerfully is the idea of this need for a different relationship, um, not only with our individual students in uh, the school system, but a different relationship with the notion of what it is to have a disability um, and how contextual that is and how much we've created and classified people into abilities and disabilities in a way that's actually very harmful to um, the process of teaching and learning. Um, and this bears out in the retention research. So one of the kind of most significant people in retention research is Vincent Tinto, who came up with a model of student persistence. Um, and what he actually found was that if you held everything else, content, background, you know, academic proficiency, um, you know, all, all other variables constant, the, the greatest reason for which students dropped out of higher education was isolation, was a sense of social isolation from other people um, in the institution. Um, and uh, the other sort of really important factor that he found contributed to people stopping out of higher education before, before finishing was something he called incongruence, and that really was something that wasn't isolation, so it wasn't um, the actual experience of being separate. Separate. It was actually a feeling, pretty deep-rooted, of feeling out of sync with the goals, values, practices of the institution. Um, and I think these two things together, um, given that they're 
you know, incredibly important um, reasons for which we lose students throughout higher education call for a different approach um, and a different relationship to students in higher education. Um, and so the notion of um, hospitality, and this before I was at, at CAST, I actually worked in uh, human resources development, primarily um, with the workforce that was serving individuals that were experiencing homelessness. So these were social workers, case managers, housing providers, um, people who are working in addiction treatment. And that field has had to change a lot because, um, and in many good ways, not everybody's changed, but the field's had to change a lot because it was largely unsuccessful because it had created conditions for people to receive services that, that weren't feasible to them. So it was creating conditions like, well, we'll give you housing, but you need to do these eight things before you get housing. Housing's a basic right. People need housing before services. They're not gonna change behaviors if they don't have a roof over their head. So it's a field that's had to think very differently about how do we reach out to and engage um, individuals in the types of services we want to offer them so that they then participate in our society in ways in which are pro-social, are, are conducive to their well-being and to the well-being of everybody around them. And Henry Nguyen um, was a outreach worker who actually worked on the streets of Toronto for a very long time. Um, and he's written several books. But um, Ken Craybill, who was a social worker and was my supervisor when I was doing this um, workforce development work, um, had this to say about this notion of, uh, of hospitality. Um, and I'm going to read it because I think it's, it's worth us thinking about. So he said, estrangement, a sense of not belonging, is common to the experience of homelessness. People living in shelters and on the streets often become separated from ordinary activities, relationships, and a sense of place and purpose in the world. Literally, one becomes a stranger. The longer homelessness persists, the more deeply ingrained this experience of disaff disaffiliation becomes. Offering the gift of hospitality is an antidote to estrangement. In his book, Reaching Out, Henry Nguyen defines hospitality as creating free and friendly space for the stranger. As such, it is an invitation to relationship. A hospitable relationship provides a welcoming presence and creates a safe refuge from an often impersonal, hostile world. Thus, a person in the midst of homelessness can experience a sense of being at home in the context of this dependable, trustworthy relationship. Um, so the concept of really creating a free and friendly space for the stranger I think is a very powerful one in higher ed. And I always hesitate a little bit to share this idea because you know, people may think it feels too sort of um, soft or too, um, you know, that's not our job in higher education. But the retention research is bearing out that this is our job because our job is to retain students and they're leaving um, when they're leaving because they don't feel that this is a free and friendly space. And I think we underestimate how much people feel like strangers in formal education settings. You know, I started at the beginning of this talk saying, you know, when I was a small child, I was given the impression that I was not well suited for formal education. Fortunately, I had many other experiences that were very positive, but that experience stuck with me long after, long after I was told I was, you know, a good learner, that these were the right environments for me, that I was given free and friendly spaces to be part of it. So we're always in that situation where we need to be thinking about how do we address this fact that people don't, don't come in feeling like this is a place where they're welcome. They don't come in feeling like they're great learners. Um, and that is part of our work in higher education. And it's not just the work of the support services, it's our work in the classroom too. How do we ensure that we're making sure that people feel that this is a free and friendly space and that we're recognizing that for many people when they enter higher education, especially those that are not a mythical average, they do feel like strangers. Um, so those are sort of the three overarching shifts that I think we need to actually deal with in, um, in higher education. And now I want to sort of turn to, I think, ways in which the UDL framework can help us to address each of those those shifts. Um, so many of you know um, about CAST. 
Um, but it is, a, for those of you who don't, it's a research and development organization um, that works to expand learning opportunities for all learners through, uh, the, through research, uh, development into technologies and tools and frameworks, um, and application of universal design for learning. Um, what we do is leverage the learning sciences and technology to create policies, classroom practices, um, and uh, try to do design for students at the margins with the hope that um, what we do for students that are most in the margins ends up be benefiting all students. Um, and the kind of underlying most important premise at CAST is that innovations that are essential to some end up being really beneficial to all students. So I said last night the concept of text-to-speech was developed probably for people who, um, who uh, had limited uh, visual ability to read um, websites. Lots and lots of people use text-to-speech, including people who are in anatomy classes that want to really better put into working memory uh, complicated medical terms. Um, they use it to support memorization. So when we design for our students that are the greatest outliers, we actually can't predict all the uses of, of this innovation, but um, we really at CAS see um, students that are in the margins as the ones um, that are kind of at the forefront of innovation. And they also tell us um, they're diagnostic in the sense that they tell us what is or is not effective in a system. They tell us how healthy the environment is for everyone. So they're sort of a public health, um, they're sort of our leaders on the kind of public health, health front, letting us know um, how healthy the environment is for everyone. Um, and then the other sort of underlying premise is that barriers to learning are not solely um, in the individual, and they're not the responsibility of the individual solely. They are really at the interaction between the environment and the individual, and so that's where we need to be able to intervene. Um, we, we, if we just intervene with individuals, we're never gonna change um, approaches to teaching and learning or create environments that work for all learners. So uh, kind of going back to that um, disclosure and stigma statistic, the 87 versus 19%, um, what we feel, and this is the, the newest book out at CAS, but what we feel is that we really need a new, um, you know, kind of high, high level statement about what higher education is, who the students are in higher ed, and it's when it comes to learning, natural variability, it's the rule, it's not the exception, and that means, you know, variability across different students, variability in a single student from one context to the other, and variable, variability in individual students over time. This is the rule, it's not the exception, and we need to really embrace that in our environments and um, having sort of these legacy systems of accommodations and saying we don't have this variability or we design for mythical average and that's okay is something that I think collectively we need to do some work to do away with because it's not supporting retention and it's, um, it's not sustainable anymore, as, as was sort of raised yesterday. Um, the good news, uh, because this can feel very overwhelming, um, is that some variability is actually systematic. So you can predict it, and if you can predict it, you can design for it. So um, that's where CAST's work grounded in the learning sciences um, has really sort of tried to figure out what, what aspects of variability are actually predictable, and then once we know what aspects are predictable, how do we then design for it? So um, everybody loves pictures of the brain. Now this is, I showed you pictures of fish, sca fish scales, now we're going to the brain. Um, so the kind of main premise of uh, UDL is that we have sort of three large learning networks in our brain. Um, the recognition network, how we perceive information, the strategic network, how we sort of act on information and you know, make, be planful and make, make um, strategies for how we're going to um, then kind of demonstrate what we know and carry out a task. And our affective network, so our sort of you know, fight or flight instinct, our sort of what motivates us to learn. And people differ quite significantly in each of these three networks. Um, 
So, you know, very clearly in the recognition network, if someone is um, hearing impaired, they're going to perceive information from the world in a very different way than someone who's not. But um, in the US right now, a lot of work is being done around supporting veterans in higher education. Um, if a veteran has a post-traumatic stress disorder, they're going to perceive information in some contexts very differently than someone else. So it's not just the sensory issues, but there are many, many ways in which people perceive information differently. And we need to design for that by presenting information in different ways. Um, people act on information in very different ways. They're planful in different ways. They manage their time differently. They um, go from having a goal to executing on that goal in different ways. And so we need to basically be able to differentiate the ways that students express what they know, how they demonstrate um, mastery over something, and how they sort of learn by doing as well. And then people obviously differ, and we know this very well, but they differ in their motivation to, um, you know, their motivation to learn in any one context. Um, so we need to account for that by providing multiple means of engagement. So we've got multiple means of representation, multiple means of action expression, and multiple means of engagement. Um, and one thing we're sort of finding increasingly important at CAST is to help people understand some of the differences between universal design and accessibility. Um, and uh, the picture here on the left um, is from the arts building, actually, at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, and it shows where it's a good example of universal design, which is the concept in architecture of designing for everyone from the outside. And CAST has um, worked on applying that to learning with universal design for learning, as well as the work from the neurosciences on the three networks. Um, but what you can see on the left is that where you would typically see stairs, you see a ramp. Um, and that's powerful in a lot of ways because it means that all students can accompany a professor up to class and get some questions answered, could you know, be the person to take a guest speaker uh, to the classroom, could extend their conversations with a fellow classmate about a problem they're trying to work out when they leave the classroom and not have to sort of, hey, I'll plan to meet you downstairs in 30 minutes. Um, on the right is um, sort of approaches to accessibility that are often um, retrofits because we haven't designed for everyone from the outset. So, um, you know, on the right, what you see is an entranceway up into a building that unless someone has to use it or unless someone wants to have a cigarette outside, um, they're, they're not going to use that entranceway. And what it, what it does is it, is it conveys to people that um, your experience is separate. And so because your experience is separate, we have separate accommodations for you, and you need to go use those. And they're often not as um, thoughtfully designed or as integrated into the experience as are the other experiences. Um, so we really want to kind of say, you know, what we need to do is think about where can we put, um, where can we put a ramp instead of a staircase that everybody can use, as opposed to how do we sort of retrofit and think about people's needs later. Um, that said, these are the UDL guidelines, and you have a, a copy in your um, packet. And what they are is sort of based on 800 peer-reviewed articles. They are basically benchmarks. They're not a checklist, and they're not, you don't need to do all these things if you want to do UDL, but they're basically a way of thinking about how do we make sense of universal design for learning in the context of curriculum and the policies that are tied to curriculum. So they're, um, they're, built, around, um, they're built around the three principles, um, and then what we'll do now is just sort of look at some examples of these. And what I should say about accessibility is that it's foundational. Without accessibility, it's very hard to have universal design for learning. Um, so we do see these as sort of very critical. And if you looked across the top, you really have more of a focus on accessibility. Um, and as you get deeper, the goal is to build sort of self-directed learners that love learning and can really um, operate regardless of the context that they're in because we foundationally built environments that work for everyone. Um, so if we look first at sort of the recognition network, um, the what of learning, 
this is often the one that's easiest for people to actually implement. Um, and, uh, and as you would imagine, the work on this is, has really developed uh, much more rapidly um, than has the work around the other two guidelines. Because it is, with the increasing use of flexible media in classrooms, it's actually not that difficult to do. Um, although it does sort of still take work and planning. So when you look at sort of the three representation guidelines, the idea of providing options for perception, providing options for language, mathematical expressions and symbols, and options for comprehension. That's what we try to do to hit on multiple means of representation. So I want to show that through an example. Um, we've been working on a cast, um, which is really quite exciting. So. Uh, in 2009, um, the Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Grant Program, it's a terrible name, um, was established, actually, the, it's a, an enormous investment. It's a $2 billion investment in community and technical colleges to help them develop programs that can be completed in two years or less. And it's designed to help people get um, skills in high-wage, high-demand industries, uh, and it's for trade adjusted workers, so for example, if their jobs have gone overseas, but it's also opened up to people who've been underemployed um, for a long time, who for whatever reason either never come to higher education or come to higher ed and not been successful. And the very interesting thing is that in the, the um, people, the community colleges that receive part of this $2 billion to build these programs, they're actually required to use universal design for learning and to meet full accessibility requirements. So um, we have generous funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to help amplify the work that's being done um, with this huge $2 billion investment around open <coughs> education resources. So these are sort of openly developed um, courses, learning assets, um, online resources that so long as they're properly attributed, you can use in, you can develop in one context and use in another. So if you were at um, Marianopolis College and you built a, a um, math module, you could then take that math module at John Abbott and you could modify it so long as you properly attributed the author, modify it and make it um, your own. So it's an incredible investment in curriculum that spreads across different things. So our job, as you can imagine, is to help ensure that that reflects universal design for learning. So as part of this work, we collaborated with the National STEM Consortium, a tact grantee of 10 community colleges that were building out career pathways in five STEM industries. Um, and we tried to help them design online learning modules um, to support um, learners uh, in the STEM program to brush up on math and communication skills so that they could get um, into career pathways more quickly and they wouldn't have barriers to you know, math skills um, and communication skills that they would need in the program but also in jobs. So one of the sort of simpler things you can do in terms of options for perception is really when needed build in long descriptions. And what long descriptions are is a way of ensuring that if you are representing information visually, um, and that information is important. In this case, you've got information that shows different, um, different representations, different types of graphs, and students need to answer what type of graph they're looking at. Um, you create in the same location, not as an accessibility afterthought, in the same location, a verbal representation of that information that describes the same information. So you're not going to say, this is a bar chart because that's giving someone the answer. You're going to describe what you see so they have the verbal representation that is equally as valuable as the visual representation. It's a fairly simple thing to actually encourage your, your faculty members to do, but it's a powerful option for perception because you're creating two representations of the same content. Um, and that's sort of a, an important, important thing to do that creates an equally uh, valuable representation. Um, what you have, oh, sorry, I wanted to do that. It's not, it's just, look on the left. Um, the, the other thing is sort of options for language, mathematical expressions, and symbols. Um, and again, with a lot of the technology that's out there, it's not that hard to do things like embed a multimedia glossary 
um, where you know, you've got terms that some of your students are not gonna understand, you create the capacity to, put, to translate those into another language, you um, create a way of sort of providing an explanation of those, you ensure that mathematical expressions um, and symbols can be understood in different different ways um, that text-to-speech can read, you need to use MathML so that it can read um, math equations uh, and not just stumble on those after some words and not know what they are. Um, so these are very important ways of making sure that everybody has the same amount of background knowledge and the knowledge they need to really concentrate on the task at hand. Um, and then the really interesting thing that I think we did with the um, National STEM Consortium um, is, uh, is work around this options for comprehension. So when you think of comprehension, it's not just how you kind of take things in from the senses, but it's how you make sense of what you're learning, right? Comprehension isn't just, oh, I was able to, to memorize that information and tell it back to somebody. It's how did I understand it based on who I am, what my aspirations are, all the rest. So what we um, did is we worked with the National STEM Consortium to build in multimedia case-based learning. Um, so case-based learning is a very powerful approach to teaching. It's used in business schools, it's used in medicine, it's used in law schools. What we wanted to do is say, a lot of the people that are coming into this program are coming with great experience from the workforce. They may have a lot of anxiety around math, and if we give it to them in sort of a decontextualized fashion, or if we give it to them all in print, um, it might really, it might shut them down. So let's think about how we represent math skills in a way that's, um, that's gonna support comprehension, that's gonna leverage their strengths and the fact that they already have a lot of workplace knowledge. And let's put those things in a way that's using multiple representations. So we have captioning, we have transcripts, we have short videos. This is Jay, he's an intern at an electric vehicle company, and he's learning his algebra skills and using his algebra skills in that context. Um, and we did the same thing for communication. So here you've got Kelly uh, in the TAC program, the trade adjusted workers are often um, older. So Kelly's our protagonist and she's um, coming back to work with, she's an industry switcher. So um, she's here work, working in the aerospace um, uh, industry, and this is air traffic control. There's about to be, please, let's hope on my flight back today, there will not be, but there's about to be a perfect storm. It's gonna impact air traffic control across the coast. Kelly has to use her new communication skills to make that happen. So we have introductory videos. We have, it's all problem-based learning. Um, and then all of the activities are built in to support that storyline, so you're solving problems, you're getting these formative assessments as you go in a way that helps you solve the actual problem. And the interesting kind of unintended benefit, when we think of the idea of we design for people at the margins and it benefits all, is using this new approach actually created a role for industry and curriculum design. So we had very large aerospace companies involved in saying, let me help you not just validate your curriculum, let me help you design it. Um, let me give you things. And then they actually pulled this and used this in their workforce training. It was also used for um, GED prep, so that's the, the high school um, alternative pathway to high school completion. It was a great opportunity for students to learn math skills and communication skills and get career exploration at the same time. So by enriching the media set, by doing things in ways that are different, you actually invite different people into the design of learning environments. And later in the next talk, I'll go over um, our website where we've sort of given, here's how to do this in 10 easy steps. This isn't hard stuff. You actually could get um, a graduate student to build these out or get an undergrad work-study student that was doing some media training to build these things out pretty simply. They're not fancy. We didn't have a big production company. Um, so those are some examples around that first principle um, and some work we did. And then looking at this strategic network, um, I'll say that this work is more aspirational right now um, than it is applied, and I think that's something for us to really think about and talk about. Um, but the area here is really thinking, you know, we have the capacity now with technology to do incredibly good work around formative assessment 
and to do work that really tells us a lot more about instruction, about how we're doing by our learners, about our own accountability to the, the variable students that we serve, but we're, we're not yet realizing that potential. So we're not really realizing the potential to really create rich assessments. And I think this in this area is really where we need to think in terms of our assessments about distributed intelligence in a different way. How do we let people express what they know and show what they know in different ways so that they're able to be part of the learning equation and be able to be supportive learners of others, learning from and with other students in ways that if we only give them one form of assessment, we, we can't do that. So there's sort of some thinking around how we move forward on these ideas of the second principle, providing multiple means of action expression. Options for physical action, options for expression and communication, and options for executive function. How do we provide options for planning, for managing your time, for um, you know, having the kind of habits that you persist when learning's difficult? And the opportunity here is sort of tied a lot to personalized learning. So personalized learning is a growing um, push not to, it's different from individualized learning, which really relies on, which I think a lot of people get afraid of with UDL, that it means I have to design a different curriculum for every single student. Um, and that's individualization. But personalization is really about putting students at the center and giving them choice and options um, and supports so that they can pull in the resources that they need to learn effectively and to be good, um, good stewards of their own learning and good supports and good stewards of other people's learning as well. So the opportunity, if we think about action expression differently um, and providing multiple means of action expression is that we actually are able to do some work around personalized learning that right now we can't. Um, so options for physical action, one of the sort of simplest things there, and if you, you know, in terms of accessibility policies or any technology procurement, um, what you need is you always need a keyboarding alternative. So um, if you think of a barrier that could be created, imagine that someone had to demonstrate in a formative assessment that they understood supply chain logistics, and the only opportunity was to drag and drop boxes into a certain order. If I have uh, limited mobility, my hand, or I even have something like repetitive stress injury, I'm not gonna enjoy it, even though I could potentially do it. That dragging and dropping, um, the process get mixed up with whether or not I understand supply chain logistics. So I always need a keyboarding alternative, so if I can't do that motion, I have an, another option. So that's when we think of sort of options for physical action, it's always thinking about what is our range of learners and how do we ensure that the, the activities we put in place for them to demonstrate what, what they know don't just support one type of learner. Um, when we think of options for expression and communication, this is a huge area of growth that um, we certainly haven't figured out what to do now. But what's so interesting, and I was saying this yesterday around agriculture, but this is sort of an example from additive manufacturing or 3D printing is that expression and communication, the requirements for how to express yourself and communicate in a lot of industries is really changing very, very rapidly because of changes in what's used in these industries. So this is an example of the Department of Energy's pilot program around 3D printing. So 3D printing is an approach to, um, to manufacturing that allows you to sort of print things out with a 3D printer that before you would need to kind of build on the shop floor. And what, um, what it's creating is new opportunities in the world of advanced manufacturing for people who previously would have been locked out from that industry, in particular individuals with certain um, physical disabilities, again showing how contextualized disability actually is. So this is an example of a wounded veteran um, and what's amazing is that the shift in, in expression and communication and how he can participate in this industry has given him sort of a, a role, but also incredible commitment to this field. So he says, I see a future in this industry and I can serve my country by learning the technology and software to, to build 3D printed exhaust systems for cars and trucks that will save Americans millions in fuel costs someday. Um, and it really is interesting to think how do we sort of 
ensure that we have options for how people can participate in our industries and how do we sort of keep track in our various areas of education um, to the shifts that are happening to make these processes, these industries more efficient and how do we then also use that as an opportunity to look at the range of people that are now being included in these environments. Um, and then the sort of third area in, um, <clears throat> in this area of action expression that I think is really powerful, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next session, um, but is this area of learning analytics. Um, and there's a huge investment uh, into the area of learning analytics now. The learning analytics um, second uh, annual symposium was in Vancouver a couple years ago. This is a progress, class progress dashboard from a great Canadian company from Desire to Learn um, that's built um, a suite of educational software, including learning management systems, to help people bring more technology into the classroom. And what it does is it captures student behaviors and it shows these in the aggregate. So it shows here an instructor. There's also user-facing things, but an instructor can see how their class as a whole is doing from behaviors like enrollment, what activities they clicked on, um, what, uh, you know, what interactions they had with other students, can measure things like that, how they did on formative assessments. Um, and so the point here around universal design for learning, um, and what's very interesting is, um, is that other people have picked up on this, is that unless we have sort of richer forms and options for how we assess students, learning analytics are gonna do the same things that our tests do historically. They're gonna tell us great information about who could drag and drop a box to show you supply chain logistics as opposed to what does someone know about supply chain logistics because I provided options for how to do this. So when we think of how we um, leverage this incredible capacity to find out more through the use of learning management systems about what students know, and we think about how we use that to impact instruction, because teachers are getting all this real-time feedback about how students are behaving, we also need to think about universal design for learning, because otherwise we're just getting information about who, who is able or unable to cope with a system that's only been designed for a small subset of our learners. Um, so interestingly, Roy P., who's at Stanford, has put together a very large um, group of people to think about what's the future of learning analytics? What do we need to do? And unrelated to, to us, they called for universal design for learning to really go hand in hand with learning analytics so that learning analytics were effective for English language learners, for, you know, for second language learners, for individuals from minorities, for individuals from... Um, who were coming maybe as first generation higher ed students. Um, so it's really powerful to see this happen, but um, we're starting to do some work around how to help people just interpret some of the usage data that's available in learning management systems, and we'd love more input on that. Um, so again, the sort of final area, and I think our work here in higher ed is still, I would say, more aspirational, but is in this area of, and we have a huge amount of work here in, um, in uh, K to 12 education, but is this area of motivation, this goes back to this concept of hospitality, um, that I actually think is, you know, if I were to think any of these things are critically important, um, I think that this is, well, they're all very important, but I think this is, we can't afford to not address um, this area of affect anymore. We really, we really need to think about how our environments work for all students. Um, <laughs> and how they're motivated to be in these environments. And so in the kind of engagement guidelines, we've got the ideas of how we recruit interest and providing options for that, how we sustain effort and persistence, and how we provide options for self-regulation. I'm gonna just show you two sort of um, quick examples. So in terms of options for recruiting interest, one thing we're finding is that we can create some things around universal design for learning, but a great number of excellent practices exist that need to be more broadly shared um, that address this issue of engagement. So this is the Center for Adult, um, adult and Experiential Learning. They conducted a study of 62,000 adult students at 48 institutions. And what they found is that when students receive prior learning 
uh, credit, not just for transfer courses, but for other things like their work experience, like their experience in the military, um, like portfolios that they brought in. When that process was done well, it actually contributed to better persistence. So we often think of prior, you know, doing, and this was true across all institutions studied. Um, so there are some people doing some incredible things around prior learning, but there's something very practical about that, right? People, if their prior learnings recognized, can get to their degrees more quickly. Uh, but there's something incredibly inviting about that in terms of you're saying to people, you're not coming to us as a blank slate. You're coming to us as someone who knows things, who cares about things, who's done things. And I think we often focus on prior learning for adult learners, but I think this has incredible relevance, especially when we think of our students that are often coming to higher ed thinking they're not good learners because of messages they've been given. How do we start with what they know and how do we validate that before we start talking about what they don't know or what they need to learn? So I think that's an incredibly powerful growth area for engagement. Um, the second one, and this is really, um, really uh, showing up as very, very important, um, and there's, there's an enormous amount of research around this and around sustaining efforts for um, persistence. And we have a research study right now that I'm involved in where we're looking at stereotype threats impact on collaborative learning environments. But stereotype threat um, basically refers to being at risk of confirming a self-characteristic, a negative stereotype about one's group. So a female student in a math class if the stereotype that uh, women are bad or worse at math than men is primed, so um, is primed, and the research on this is incredibly strong, um, they will do worse on a math exam than will men. And this is, you know, in very, very tightly controlled randomized studies, this has shown up again and again. If a stereotype um, is primed about uh, minority students being less successful academic academically than white students, if that stereotype is primed, it actually bears out across the, across the entire year in GPA. So this research started in higher education, looking at the experiences of women in math classes, and there are now a lot of strategies to intervene around, um, around this very, very important engagement issue in higher education that's hugely impacting academic outcomes like course grades, grades on exams. Um, and I certainly could sort of talk more about what some of those strategies are, but even very, very simple things, like at the beginning of the year, having students do an activity where they affirm um, things about themselves uh, and qualities they have that may not even be related to the subject matter, just doing that simple exercise at the beginning of the year holds across the entire year. Um, doing things like focusing on growth potential and giving feedback that's mastery oriented as opposed to fix, like saying you're so smart, it's not good because if someone doesn't think they're so smart or doesn't, um, you know, well maybe tomorrow I won't be so smart, those are fixed ideas. So the area of stereotype threat is really huge for engagement and is one to really keep your eye on. Um, so I'll finish there and I'll just sort of give a, a plug for what we're going to talk about next. So what we've um, done at CAS tied to this funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is we built a new um, web resource called UDL on Campus. And I'll talk about that more later. And it's really a first pass. It's um, by no means a complete project. And um, you know we've, we sort of are looking for feedback on how to continue to work on this and improve this. But it's designed for multiple stakeholders in the institutions, not just targeted at faculty. Um, and the goal, and, and also um, it was designed by a whole range of people, including people in institutions of higher ed that were in charge of procurement policies for technology, um, people who are experts in sort of accessibility law, um, people who were, um, who were speech language pathologists, um, we had uh, individuals that had uh, sensory disabilities that really took on our flexible multimedia. What does that look like? Drawing on their own experience from higher ed and people who were sort of ex experts in, in curriculum development. Um, so we had sort of a range of people trying to design this. Um, and I'll talk about that more extensively later. And that's kind of a first pass at helping people try to implement some of the 
some of these ideas around UDL. Um, and I'll just leave you with this quote, which I love very much, and I, my other sort of uh, area of work is really around communities of practice, another very, very powerful um, innovation in education over the last, um, or innovation in learning over the last 30 years. And this is Etienne Wenger, who's really the founder of Communities of Practice. Um, and he says, education in the deepest sense and at whatever age it takes place concerns an opening of identities, exploring new ways of being that lie behind our current state. Whereas training aims to create an inbound trajectory targeted at competence in a specific practice, education must strive to open new dimensions for the negotiated self. It places students on an outbound trajectory towards a broad field of possible identities. Education's not merely formative, it's transformative. Um, so thank you very much. And <laughs> Questions? Yeah, okay, and there'll also be, for anybody who's interested, time to sort of ask some questions later. All the re references are here, and I also, I'm happy to also, if this is not the format you wanna ask questions, but you have questions, I'm happy to connect later and, and try to answer some questions or point you to resources or people as well, so. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'd like to hear your thoughts on uh, would be the very popular and, and persisting notion uh, that learners can be categorized as visual learners or kinesthetic or, or audio, and that they're always that type of learner as well? It's an excellent question. So, um, you know, this comes a lot, and, and I think it's um, similar to the idea of, uh, of sort of differentiated instruction where, you know, you've got this instruction works for this person, this instruction works for that person. And I think the way of sort of looking at responding to that is saying that, you know, in any learning situation, so if you think about assessment, a, a, a summative assessment, you are always, always measuring three things. You're always measuring engagement, you're measuring people's anxiety level, you're always measuring their strategies. How good are they at taking this test? And you're always measuring how well they can perceive what they know. And if you look at those three things, those are gonna vary enormously from learner to learner, but they're also gonna vary enormously from what's put in front of someone. So certainly someone may have a preference for you know, learning and you know, having their math stuff presented as word problems versus you know, graphs and charts and whatever. But the fact that those three variables are always, are always in flux, it doesn't make it possible for someone to be one thing, because the barriers are always about the individual and the environment. So I think supporting people's preferences is great, and the key is providing options, but someone's not going to choose the same options in, any, you know, in every single given circumstance. So does that help at all? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, Sam will be available at break, so by all means, I'm sure she'll uh, be happy to answer any further questions. I'm just going to get to the mic. I want to thank Sam for a, a thought-provoking and deep and rich and scholarly presentation. It's a, a high-level, top-tier um, session that she's given us this morning, and Sam, I want to thank you so much for that. You're exactly why I wanted this conference to happen.